the breadth of what I do now with so many different people. It's amazing how we're so unbelievably human, you know, <laughs> and we're going to mess it up from time to time. And I don't think anybody should walk away from these types of conversations thinking, oh, if I just do that, I'm never going to have a problem. Without question. You know. got my good friend Dustin Gallion with me. We've worked together for over a decade now and really kind of been on joint exploration of of how do you coach holistically and how do you put it into practice. So Dustin, thanks for thanks for the conversation and being the inaugural guest. Why don't you don't give us your life story, but give us the highlights of two or three things of why people should care what you have to say when leading Generation Z. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. Well, I think one would be because I had a lot of failure in it early in my coaching career and then kind of had some aha moments, if you will, and then dug deep into generational studies and uh, now get to, get to lead leaders and help teach others, whether it's coaches or organizations, on how to better work, better understand maybe the generation. So take someone who is pretty unsuccessful, learned a lot, then began to teach it and now put it in into practice as a coach. Yeah, we've often talked about You know, I'm sure my grandparents said my parents' generation didn't get it. And my parents, our parents said the same thing about us. And now we're saying it out about this generation. So some of this conversation is, I think, normal. But I do think some has changed. And the kids, the students we're working with and we're coaching are vastly different, especially over the last five to six years. So I was, would you agree, disagree? Kind of give me your thoughts on that. Yeah. One of the lines that I use often when, coaching coaches or leading organizations or just speaking about this generation in general is to say they just don't get it is not good enough. I would also say there's some similarities that I think an over generalization is, oh, they're just, they're just wildly different every way. No, I think the human condition, the heart, the fact that all people, especially young people want to feel loved, want to feel valued, want to feel important. Um, that hasn't changed. How we do that, <laughs> the the vehicle and maybe um, the frequency of how we remind this generation, that might be different. So, um, but there's some similarities, but yeah, definitely some different ways we have to meet and how to connect with this generation has changed. Yeah. In what ways? Talk more about, give specific examples, if you can, of ways you feel like you have to connect now with this generation as opposed to yeah. Years. Well, a couple of words come to, to mind, and I think we all use in some ways our reference of our parents. So I'll use a couple of examples. Growing up, when my dad asked me to do something or when he gave criticism, and sometimes it was constructive, <laughs> it was because I'm your dad and I said so. And that was that was good enough. There mm-hmm. wasn't much, there wasn't a whole lot of follow-up questions. And this generation, I believe, deeply wants to know why. And the ability to take time to explain that is really important. The other part of that is we're talking about the most right brain, didactic, visual, hands-on generation of all time. And again, this is stuff that Tim Elmore has, uh, that I've read and that I've heard and and think that he's a, a specialist in it. But this generation is one that, unlike any other generation, I think how we define toughness as a coach It's wildly different in this generation. I think, to be fair, I think even when I was playing um, late 90s, early 2000s, toughness was this outward, hey, uh, brash, almost um, type of thing. Now, I believe toughness is looked at very differently from athletes, from employees, from this generation. And so how do we how do we get into that? How do we how do we reach them in that way? And again, I think that visuals is I think that application is way different. I give an example. When I first started coaching, I was a motion purist. Basketball was all about motion. I played in motion. I had success in motion. I, I knew motion. So as a coach, I'm like, we're we're playing motion offense. And we're three years in. Um, I think you would define this as not very good coaching. Um, the 50-50 games where we were equally talented, we didn't win many of those. We barely won the games that we were superior. And we never won a game we shouldn't have. So I think we would probably agree. If you look at that, that's either a young coach or coach that's not very good. So I remember after a game getting beat very badly and I looked at our assistant coaches, we were walking in the locker room. I said, these guys just don't get it. And he stopped and he said to me, you know, coach, maybe we don't get it. And at the very <laughs> least, how are we going to help them get it? <laughs> and, and so uh, this phenomenon had happened. John Calipari had won a national 
championship with Memphis and then gone to Kentucky. And every high school player I was recruiting, they ran dribble drive, meaning they got the basketball and they just dribbled, 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 and they threw it to the next guy. And that guy dribbled, dribbled, dribbled. Well, that was the opposite of motion. And so I had to decide if, although it was different than motion offense, was it wrong? Well, it wasn't wrong. It was just different. So the next year, we ran dribble drive and we uh, we won 21 games. We had the third leading scorer in the country who was an All-American. And no lie, only 12 months later, I had high school coaches and other college coaches calling me on how to run dribble drive offense. It changed my career. Went to a national tournament and um, a ton of winning seasons and, uh, you know, players that had postseason awards. Again, I asked the question, did they not get it? Or did I had to, did I need to meet them where they were at? And so that, that story resonates with me all the time in coaching of it, it, because it's different than mine may not mean they don't get it. Yeah. It may mean I need to meet them where they're at. I heard uh, one of our coaches here told me a story of, you know, when, when parents come to complain or whatever the issue is, one of his lines is I hear what you're saying, but right now I'm what you got. And I think the flip side is true, too, of we say, oh, the kids, are, well, they're what we got. You know, you can either choose to be right or effective. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I think that Tim Elmore, Generation Z, uh, I mean, we've geeked out on him for years. And, yes. Uh, I don't think he walks on water except for, well, maybe on maybe on Mondays. But um, <laughs> I just heard him talk at a convention and he said for Gen Z, I'm going off this toughness thing you talked about. He said we have to begin with empathy mm. with them in order to get to grit. Wow. So begin with empathy to get to grit. Yeah. Thoughts? Agree? Disagree? Yeah. Think about how many high-level, mid-level leaders there are. Okay. So whether that's an organization, a coach, um, a, a VP, a CEO, and think about if you ask them about grit, how did they learn grit? You know, they would have learned that from the generation ahead of them or generations ahead of them. And now you look at grit and what you just said of starting with empathy. <laughs> and I think you've got two different things that, but they equal, they, they want grit or toughness or pers- perseverance. So how do you get there? Um, I would wildly agree with that statement that we have to start with empathy. But let's put that in practical terms. So again, as a coach, when I was coaching early in my career, I would talk about toughness and and that equaled some conditioning Mm -hmm. or that equaled, quote, harder practices, but it was also the punishment. So when a player didn't make the right rotation when I was a basketball coach, I'd blow the whistle and we would run. And I would equate that with toughness. (laughs) Looking back on that, I would ask you the question, were your were your good players? Were all of your players? They wanted to play. Were they purposefully making a mistake on a rotation um, or what you were trying to do? No. And so what I found is our teams were really good. At, we were really conditioned. And we weren't very good. Um, and and I also asked the question, why was that? Well, that's that's how I learned. That was the default button. Mm-hmm. Versus now. When I look back on that, it was like, man, if anybody needed to do conditioning, maybe it was me. Maybe I wasn't teaching it in a manner where they could get it. And so I would also ask the question about about grit. I think it's often misused. Um, Again, I'll say this personally. It's something that I'm frustrated. And to get this frustration out, I'm going to turn to conditioning or I'm going to turn to, you know, maybe uh, talking abrasively or I'm going to all these things that are really that's a more personal, I'm upset. And old boss of ours used to call that just laziness. You know? <laughs> and what a, what a, what a wonderful, what a wonderful statement he, he made there. I, I you asked a question a minute ago um, about how do we get them to do this? And, and I've talked a lot about three things uh, for any leader with this generation, making experiences hands-on image intense and giving them platforms to talk about their experience. And I'm sure I've read that somewhere from Tim mm-hmm. Elmore or, or that's influenced it heavily, but that changed for me as well. We talk about grit and wanting, wanting the people we lead to get there. We've got to give them an experience to do that. We've got to make it image intense where they can see it or re-see it or relearn it and then give them the opportunity to, to talk about that experience. So all that to say, I believe with this generation leading them, it is tougher. It is tougher to, and it shows more toughness to learn about what makes them tick, to learn about how they learn and implement that instead of the old default of, well, this is how we've always done this, how we're going to do it because mm-hmm. it's not working. Now, do you think that's a form of empathy? 
Were you talking about learning how they learn? Would that be? I, I think it's, it's a, I mean, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, again, if the question is, they just don't get it. If that's not good enough, well, well, how do we help them? So I hear a lot of coaches and bosses and again, organizational leaders say, um, man, I feel like they're coming in as our team or part of our, our uh, business. And we're trying to get to the bottom line or trying to get, you know, something accomplished. And in addition to doing the work, I'm having to educate them. And my answer is absolutely. <laughs> so the new leader, the new coach, the new boss, it's not only teaching the skills to get the win or get uh, the bottom line done. It's educating this generation on how we do some of those, one of my favorite words, transferable skills. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's an oversimplification, but I think what you're saying has been done. I mean, you look at John Wooden and the old story, uh, he taught his guys how to tie their shoes. Yeah. You know, you start a baseline. And I, as you've been talking, I've been thinking about my worlds where we're starting to become the middle aged or older guys. So in my world where I supervise coaches, um, I don't know if it's all that different. I mean, we've changed the way we do hiring to clearly define expectations and get feedback. And I think I've, I don't know if intuitively is the right word, but I've probably learned the hard way to lead with empathy, where when I'm delivering hard news or we're talking about it, I lead with this sucks. I get it. You know, I'm sorry. Yep. And um, that seems to let down walls where if I don't acknowledge that, don't don't leave opportunity just to vent, um, I think it can breed a lot of ill will. Let me ask you a follow-up question with that, because I agree. Talk to me about how how often you have with this generation, uh, I will call it giving back. I've heard you say sometimes playing one down mm -hmm. where uh, I, I, I'll ask the question, how often have you found yourself giving back in a conversation or playing one down and how effective has that been with this generation? I, I again, go back to our guy, Tim Elmore. Um, he wrote in Generation IY, which that gets when we talk this generation, the student athlete just defining for listeners, looking at people that were born 99, 2000 and on in a Generation IY would be five or 10 years before that. But kind of the the technology generation. Um, but Tim Omar says you have to know what you're talking about and you have to be authentic in order to get people to buy into you as a leader and listen to you. And the one down thing works as long as it's authentic. And, um, and when I've been able to do that and genuinely think you have something to learn from others, I think is that one down thing. Um, I'm trying to think how to describe that for listeners, but yeah, it's not self-deprecating, but I don't know it all. How, how can I learn from you? How can we work together? I think there's a, there's a piece of people feel like we're struggling with instead of against, mm. you know, I've turned into the people that always want to be in conflict. You know me, I can, I can deal with conflict, but when it's always banging heads against each other and saying, or instead of saying, Hey, this is a hard situation. It's no fun, but let's lock arms and walk through it. I think that's what the one down leads to. And if it's authentic, I think it's pretty effective. Yeah. Wildly agree. That's a great yeah. statement. What does that look like with your the, the athletes you work with? Yeah. Uh, thanks for that. I think one of the differences, and I think it comes out of fear and I think it also comes with experience, but I think the generational tie is with it. When I started as a head coach 15 years ago, uh, I was rarely going to say, hey, guys, you know what? Looking back on that, I think I missed it. Mm -hmm. Or guys, practice today. Hey, that's on me. Um, you know, I'll be better tomorrow um, or whatever that is. So giving back in that, I would have never done that. I think early it was out of fear and inferiority. Uh -huh. Now, 15 years in, <laughs> I say it bi-weekly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Guys, we could have been, we just came off a conference championship on Wednesday. Friday, we had I counted the days till nationals. We had 25 days. I'm sending out the group text of what we're going to practice, how we're going to do it. And I'm I'm ready Friday to go have a full-blown practice. I get an individual text from several of our guys and very kind and said, Hey, coach, after 90 holes, 72 of competition and 18 of uh, practice the day hey, before. Dummy, we're tired. <laughs> That's it. Hey, coach, pump the brakes, yeah. you energetic fella. Um, we're we're still recovering. Um, and and so I sent a text ten minutes later and said, guys, that's on me. Got a little excited. I I think it's best we just take one more day rest. Mm -hmm. That didn't happen fifteen years ago. I said it. We did it right or wrong. And again, that felt more into um, going back to the leadership styles I had seen. Mm -hmm. So. I love this question. Um, 
It's from Joe Ehrman out of his book, Transformation, or Inside Out Coaching is what it's called. Mm-hmm. But two-part question for you. I want you to think back to when you started as coaches, when we were working together trying to initially, not that we have it figured out now, but I don't know if we even knew the question back then, mm-hmm. uh, and then who you are now. Um, what does it feel to be, how does it feel to be coached by you? So start with back then and then move to now. <clears throat> and even dive into how does it feel to be coached by you when you're in a good space? And how does it feel to be coached by you when you're not at your best? <laughs> well, I, I think I would be guilty um, early in my coaching career of, I think players would have said, he's got a ton of energy, ton of passion, works really hard. And I also think they would say, if I'm just brutally honest, that um, outcome was going to impact attitude. Mm -hmm. Outcome was going to impact um, how we were around them, i.e. my heart was right. I got into coaching. I say a six word story now how I would uh, do that. I wanted to love, lead and disciple young men. I, I got into it for that. Uh, no, a line, way you, no way you put that into six words back then. <laughs> no way. Yeah. <laughs> Nor, um, I think you and I have used this line before. I, I believe my talent was in front of my character. Hmm. And and again, not that I was berating guys or foul or unethical, but the outcome weighed so much on me that it it dictated my attitude. It dictated um, the, the overall feel of our team practice, it dictated how meals were after games. And you say, hmm. well, that's a little thing. No, it's a huge thing Absolutely. Um, to model. So I, I think they would have said those things. I also think they would have said at that, at that age, probably a little arrogance and a little bit of misplaced pride. Mm-hmm. I remember saying at times, um, you know, almost a me versus them. Mm-hmm. You know, I've made this thing up and you guys are messing it up. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Does that not work? And it definitely doesn't work with this generation. Yeah. Fast forward to now, um, I would, sh- I-, I believe that guys would still say energy and passion. Mm-hmm. I would really hope they would say working smarter um, than harder. I'm still guilty at times of working hard and not mm-hmm. very smart. But then the last one is, and and I think this has been the biggest one, is that coaches for me. And I would say how I got to be for them is to be focused on the process versus the outcome. I was going to quit coaching basketball two years in. We, as I said, couldn't beat anybody better than us. Didn't win a lot of the 50, 50 games and barely beat the teams. We should have sitting in a Walmart parking lot on a snowy night, right before Christmas. I just bought my nephews some gifts and I called a coaching mentor and said, Hey, I'm going to be done. I'm going to quit. And he said, I have never forget this. He was older and wiser and gray. He said, okay. He said, make sure you're, you do a resignation letter and make sure you shake everybody's hand on the way out because you want to do that thing the right way in case you ever want to get back into this. And I fully expected him to say, well, why? And give me the yeah. big stops. And then he asked me two questions. He said, Hey, um, before I let you go and before you quit two questions, do your guys know you love them? And I said, well, I think so. And he said, well, if they don't know, that's your fault. And then number two, he said, are you having any fun? And I I never forget saying this. I said, well, coach, winning's fun. And we're not winning. So I guess we're not having any fun. And I'll never forget. He said, young man, he said, the process of winning, the journey to get to wins. That's what's fun. He said, you win some, you lose some. That's a byproduct of of the process. He said, "Um, but the journey, that's what's fun. And I couldn't let that go. It wildly changed my life, my my coaching um, approach. All that to say now, I I would tell you that our guys, I believe fully would say, coach is about the process. He's about the process. Do we enjoy the wins? You bet. Is it still hard to lose? You bet. Mm -hmm. But um, modeling what that looks like for our guys has become a lot better for me as I focused on the process. That's so hard though. Um, <laughs> cause winning matters and you want to win. Is it everything? Absolutely not. Um, but I do think winning broadens your impact hmm. and it's, it's just more fun to win than lose. You, you want to be the best. And I think that leads me into, I mean, something we talk about a lot at friends is the 3d coaching piece. Mm-hmm. And I think, in my early years, I was searching for something like this to have a framework on how to coach the whole person. And um, I, 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 I do think this is it. Uh, tell me about, I mean, 3D for our listeners, it talks about three levels of coaching. The first level is really coaching the skills of the sport. It's the, it's the barrier to entry. If you don't know how, you're doing, how to do that, you're not going to last as a coach. Second level is the team, the sports psych, the team cohesion, the goal setting motivation. And the third level is getting into the heart of the athlete. I'm curious when you look at what I hear you saying is you're, you're talking all second and third dimension stuff. Talk to me about the second dimension 
and what pieces you feel like you're learning to put into practice more. Because when I hear you say process, I'm thinking those things, the process of the year, the process of developing the team. Um, yeah, talk talk about that. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate, before I answer that, you talking about winning. I think oftentimes somewhere there's this fairy tale that if we're um, if we're just really great people and all that, that winning doesn't matter. And, and I think you and I both know, and I would say the greatest way I, ha- I have a greater opportunity to impact the players that I am coaching if we are absolutely excellent in the win loss column. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to not say that. Is it everything? No, but if you are excellent there, I think you have a, and, a better opportunity. Let's be honest. People say, Oh, it's about all the other stuff and not winning. They're full of crap. Yeah. Or not very good. Yeah. Or not very good. <laughs> We've both been there. We've probably been there. Yeah. I, said <laughs> I said it a lot. My first Anyways, thing. second dimension, second dimension, um, team cohesion, motivation, those things for me, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about those two specifically, especially with this generation. I mean, um, how could those be more important? I eat. This generation wants to feel valued and a part of of mm-hmm. what they're doing. Um, we hear a lot about. I, I've heard the statement when I used to coach. Players came in and said, "How can I help the team?" Now players come in and say, "How can you help me?" And if not, I'll join the transfer portal that's bigger than ever. Right? Uh, I hear that. I'm not saying there's not some truth to that. I would also say it's our job as coaches to add value mm-hmm. to every single guy. Understand that guys may be motivated differently. How do we help motivate those players? And then team cohesion. What are the things that you said it earlier that we're genuinely and authentically doing that that are fun, that say, I want to be a part of this regardless of my playing time or my role that I'm given or the role that I'm growing into? So very frankly for us, this it, it's been meals. It's been mm-hmm. over food and fellowship. It's been over handwritten notes. It's been over one-on-one meetings. And again, if you're a coach or leading anything, you know that the day-to-day tasks, you've got stuff to do. Mm -hmm. The days that I do one-on-ones, that's a long day for me because then after practice, I still have to get the work done that you're supposed to get done during the day. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I think when I think about second dimension, the hardest thing for me as a coach was saying, okay, when I focus on second dimension, that may actually take a little bit of time or rearrange or add time in addition to all the skills and the things we need to teach, the 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 return on that is exponential. Not mm-hmm. only as humans, but then as your team and and your your opportunities to succeed. So, and I agree with you. Three D coaching, we didn't know that exists. I, mm-hmm. I don't think we knew that that was there or what it was when we started. What an unbelievable tool! Oh, I I wish we would have been smart enough to to beat people to it. Yeah, and, but um, yeah, I'll I'll share a story. Um, so like you said, you won a conference championship. I guess it was last week. And it was one of the most, the neatest moments of the year for me as a, as an athletic director, where I got there for the last day, I think it was, you guys were, the last group was on hole six or seven and, um, we're walking around. It took us, I mean, one of my first golf tournaments ever, I couldn't find you guys. I've been, I walked two miles just trying to figure out where you were, but I run into one of your players who last year and a lot of this year had been in your top five. And for you, those don't know golf, um, you get, take seven to a tournament. Five are designated as the scorers, and then four are counted in the team total. And this guy had been in our scores most of the year and last year, right? Correct. And, yeah, several uh, times. Yeah, and started um, started the tournament as our number five and then just didn't play well. And I'm sure, it. I mean, so you subbed him out and put somebody else in that spot for the next round. And I'm sure that was emotionally difficult, but no doubt the right, right thing to do. And this guy had to just been so disappointed he didn't play well he didn't get put back in oh he didn't play well the first day played good the rest of the time but still didn't get put back in because the other guy was playing well and i run into this kid on the last day on the ninth or tenth hole he was already done and you know i was preparing for this conversation but it's like how you doing and when i ask how he's doing he says good and then he proceeds to excitedly give me the rundown of almost what every score is doing right now and then he didn't brush me off but he nice very nicely said i have to go something's happened on the screen. I need to go support my teammate. <laughs> and what a what an unbelievable um, testament to to number one, his character, yes. but but also the um, the team cohesion. I'm gonna tell one story that I'd love to hear you reflect on a little bit after after the match, you did a cheesy thing I would never do as a coach, but 
I was part of it where you all got on the 18th green parents, grandparents, team included arms around each other. You prayed, you'd affirmed each other and gave openings for people to people to talk. And um, your seven guy spoke up who wasn't a scorer, international student, came halfway across the world. And in this moment of celebrating the win, he thanked the parents, the grandparents and the people from our area for taking him in and all the international students and making him feel like family. In the moment where unbelievable athletic accomplishment, that's what we're talking about. I mean, I get chills thinking about it right now. So, yeah, that's a pat on the back and tell everybody how you how you did it, because I think everybody's <laughs> life will be easier. Yeah, well, it's easy, right? Yeah, yeah, very easy. Um, well, what a what a village story. You know, what a what a what a testament to awesome parents and grandparents and players who care for each other, who uh, who have more life and parenting experience than you or I. Yeah. And that who say, man, if this were my kid halfway across the world, what would that be like? I also think it's a testament to those guys. They're highly likable. <laughs> they're they're young people you want to have in your homes. They're not perfect by mm-hmm. any stretch. Uh, but guys that boy, you want to represent, I think, your team and community. I'll I'll answer that story with a story. If you said, how does that happen? And I'll pretend that I had a huge hand in it. <laughs> um, what people don't know is the same young man who said that um, in the circle. We went to a match play event. Our conference is one of the few conferences that does a, a match play event in the fall. And we got second. And uh, we got second on the 18th hole. Um, we needed, we had the first two points on the board and we couldn't get the third point on it. Little, little unlucky, a little unfortunate. But we get in the vans and uh, uh, I, I say to the guys, hey, guys, what, what is one thing every guy has learned from this? What is one area we can grow? Before we had the three hours home, I wanted to hear that. And before anybody says anything, what well, the match play event, you get to bring six and you can sub out per round, but only five play. And our first five from day one had played incredibly well. Your sixth guy in this, he doesn't even get a play. He's just out on the driving range by himself, warming up, hitting balls all alone. And we never subbed him. And so that same young man, when we got in the van, he said, Coach, before we answer any of that, he's like, I just want to thank, which was our sixth man. I want to thank him. He was the most, he was the most impactful guy all week. <laughs> um, he was, he was encouraging everybody, bringing everybody water, telling everybody great job. And you never subbed him in. And his attitude, it was just unreal. He's like, yeah, I, he made it easy for me to play hard. And I wanted to win for him. Uh, what a powerful moment. What a great example. But here's what we did as a team. You talk about team cohesion and motivation. We retold that story mm-hmm. all year. I retold that story. Any opportunity I had, I would say, man, I love this group. And I know what type of guys we have. We have guys. And I'd go right back to yeah. that match play and just reaffirmed and tried to, to, I mean, you talk about culture. Culture is how we do what we do. I think oftentimes we take that example, and as a young coach, I sure did, that example of someone who is not doing it, and we put time and energy and we get drained on the one person who's not instead of trying to catch someone doing it right and then mm-hmm. affirming the heck out of them. Yeah. And so we took that story and just affirmed it and affirmed it and told it and retold it. And uh, I think guys believed in it. Mm-hmm. So that was huge. And it's interesting because, boy, when all that comes together, it's so fun, but it won't every year. And Correct. you got to trust your process and then be able to adjust because. I feel like as I got out of coaching and I spent a decade in coaching and then got into administration um, and the breadth of what I do now with so many different people, it's amazing how we're so unbelievably human, you know, (laughs) and we're going to mess it up from time to time. And I don't think anybody should walk away from these types of conversations thinking, oh, if I just do that, I'm never going to have a problem with that. You know, yeah. So anyways, all right, we finish up going to try a rapid fire round. So. Um, I'm going to ask you a question. You have to try to answer quickly okay. and um, just let us get a few more thoughts and get to know you because I think your mind works well on the topic of this this podcast. Um, so first one, uh, what's one thing we haven't covered that you think we should have? Oh, my. Mm, I think we should cover next time or a time later how this generation, they have the highest IQ, and and but their EQ is not as high. So conflict resolution skills specifically to how do you embrace or have a difficult conversation with this generation? Name a book that's greatly influenced your life. Uh, the Bible and Good to Great. Good to Great. Mm. How has failure set you up later for success? Do you have a favorite failure? I would say this. I think 
having accountability in those times of failure and leaning on those people have helped me realize to ask the question, what do I not know that I don't know? Mm -hmm. That's what I've learned most about failure, I think, in, in a sentence. Well said. In less than 30 seconds, how do you define success in your work? Loving our guys, our guys knowing um, that I am for them, making space for our guys to share their stories. Um, and for me, modeling what it, what it means to be a believer in Jesus. Hmm. Um, and notice I said modeling. 15 years ago, I would have said, making sure that every single guy believes exactly what I believe. That's the gift <laughs> of the Holy Spirit. My job is just to model it. Yeah. Favorite movie? <laughs> oh, uh, Lonesome Dove. How old are you? <laughs> and then uh, what is one unusual habit or practice that you love that you think makes you better? Hmm. I don't know if it's unusual. Uh, it's, it's the one I'm doing right now. One, I drink uh, unsweet iced tea all day, just so you know. So that's unusual <laughs> too. I have taken um, our tournament times. You're going to think this is crazy, but I've been taking our tournament. And when I'm walking with the guy, I'm not doing this with him. But when he goes up to hit a shot or hit a putt, I begin to pray for his family, someone in his family, him. Um, it's like a, like a golf tournament for me right now. It's like nine hours of, of prayer. And it's just <laughs> been really powerful. Again, it's not to say we're not focused. We are, but just different sections that I have throughout the day that I can just take time to pray. It's a rare sport that you can do that. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. Love it. Uh, well, good. Well, I appreciate you. Appreciate you doing this. Um, any, any final thoughts? Yeah, I would just go back to, we have to decide as leaders leading this generation, if we're going to say they just don't get it, that's not good enough. To I, I would say that we've got to continue to learn to help lead. And, uh, and I think enjoy that part of it because as, as someone said yesterday, I'm teaching, but I'm having to educate them along the way. What a great task. What a great opportunity and responsibility for us. So it's going to be fun. And uh, there's a lot more to learn. Cool. Well, thank you so much. I'm very grateful for your friendship and in working with you. And I, I, in some ways, I feel like we're just scratching the surface. So uh, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Beyond Coaching. We hope today's discussion provided you with insights and understanding and leading. As always, thank you to the 3D Institute and Friends University for their support and passion for empowering leaders. And if you have any questions for today's guest or myself, all our contact information is in the show notes. Thanks for tuning in. Beyond Coaching is a podcast of the Impactful Coaching Project in partnership with Friends University. The Impactful Coaching Project seeks to develop coaches that coach the whole person. The Impactful Coaching Project is the thought leader in coaching the 21st century athlete and produces training, information, and original research to help coaches develop. For more information, check out impactfulcoachingproject.substack.com. Thank you for listening.